afternoon, evening and morning all. Uh, and on behalf of OA, we continue to be really proud of the association uh, with FBM and Lena. It's great fun. We've learned a lot. Uh, and that's what this is all about. So hopefully uh, Cal and I can add to that experience this evening. Um, a great topic for us, you know, is open talent challenging the status quo in the enterprise IT market? Short answer, yes. Uh, we're going to spend about 45 minutes giving you some observations on why that is. Um, it's fundamentally important to us. I mean, we set up Open Assembly uh, off the back of the premise that we, we, we saw this disruption coming. I've uh, I've been working with Open Assembly as a director of consultant services for the past couple of years. So I'm supporting our clients in the adoption of open talent solutions as we go through this disruption. So I can give you some first hand perspectives on all of that. I've been in enterprise IT like forever since they invented email, basically uh, three different roles for me. One, uh, latterly advising businesses on how to uh, outsource and source uh, on both sides of the equation, both for the vendor community and enterprise adopters. I spent five years as a partner in Accenture selling uh, IT services and developing new ones. And on, on the uh, in the last century, <laughs> uh, I was a buyer of enterprise IT services for British American Tobacco and Diageo. So I've seen this from a number of perspectives and I'll hopefully bring those to bear. Uh, and I'm delighted to share uh, the opportunity to discuss all that with you with Cal Adamson. Uh, we've had our eye on distributed in Cal for quite some time. We think they are one of the catalysts of this disruption. So, Cal, perhaps you could say hello to the audience and just take time to play in a little bit about Distributed and where you guys are on your journey before we get cracking. Yeah, you got it. Thank you very much, Bryn. Um, I do not have the CV that you have, um, <laughs> but I've, I've got a good perspective, unique perspective, put it that way. Um, so, I'm the founder and CEO of Distributed. Uh, what we do at Distributed is we ensure that enterprises can engage um, globally distributed freelance software development teams at scale, right? So that they can deliver on their digital roadmaps um, super cost effectively and super quickly. And um, we do that because there is a large and growing talent shortage, right? And that is actually rebalancing, let's say the power construct between employer and employee, um, particularly in tech services. And, and what that's done is it's seen um, freelancing in tech services grow to about 40% of total available talent population, right? And what enterprises have always struggled with is engaging freelancers at scale. Yeah. So hence distributed, right? And we, we came to, to this company, this business, this model, um, and this growth um, from freelancing. So I was a freelancer for over 10 years. Uh, prior to that, I was an engineering student, uh, joined a startup in London, uh, became a freelancer um, and saw the problems that all of my clients were having um, with their talent models, existing talent models, basically. And all my clients were enterprises. Um, so we lean into cloud talent, we lean into on-demand talent. Um, and five years later, um, we are the, the UK's number one private talent cloud. Um, we most recently just signed a 30 million pound contract with British Telecom here yeah. in the UK. Um, and over the past four years, we've seen consistent triple digit growth. Um, but there was an inflection point, right? In about 2019, where we discovered that we were an enterprise grade business. And I think yeah. that's what we're going to get into shortly. Is what changed? What changed? Love it. Love it. Well, what what a rocket ride, and and really looking forward to getting stuck into some of these uh, some of these points. So, so what we're going to do for you um, this afternoon is we're going to explore two or three dimensions of this. First, we're going to have a look at what is the status quo. You know, what is the state of the enterprise IT services market as we see it, and how are clients who are buying this stuff feeling about that? What's driving uh, their activities, and how well suited is the is the typical model of adoption to what they're looking for? Then we'll look forward slightly. We'll have a look at you know what you can expect over the next 12 to 24 months and how some of these trends are going to shape the market and create sort of disruption uh, that Cal's alluded to and where you might see that. And then we'll try and turn the table a little bit and get into the so what of all this. You know, if you're a freelancer, if you're a buyer of enterprise IT services, um, or you're an incumbent provider, you know, what is it you can start to do to position yourself to take advantage of the disruption? Because there's plenty to go around. Uh, and I think if you think through this carefully, we're seeing really significant benefits being delivered through this new model on all three uh, of those different dimensions. 
Um, and then, you know, probably by then it'll be time for another prime minister in the UK. So we'll wrap it up and go and have a cup of tea and just check the news to make sure nothing else ridiculous has happened today. Um, we'll try and take questions before we do that uh, towards the end of the session. Feel free to, to log them into the chat as we go along and we'll try and pick that up towards the end of the session. But let's turn, uh, let's turn to where we are today. Let's have a little look at this uh, status quo. The reason this is such a fundamentally important conversation, the enterprise IT services market is enormous. Um, it's just just touched over $1.2 trillion in terms of enterprise IT spend in the last 12 months, 55 million souls employed in this industry. Uh, it's growing like topsy, a minimum 7% compound annual growth rate for the last few years and something that we expect to see continue on that sort of trajectory. So at face value, it's in rude health uh, and continues to, to be so. Below those sort of numbers, though, there's some really interesting trends that we've been observing. You know, um, the, the players in this market have got some new company. You know, it used to be typically dominated by the big players from Accenture through to Wipro. You know, the sort of 40, uh, 30 to 40 billion dollars a year IT service behemoths. But, you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen two new groups of businesses start to reshape uh, how tech's being consumed. Obviously, the hyperscalers. Amazon now turning over $65 billion a year and to grow, growing like topsy, chased by their two competitors. And somewhere in between the two cohorts, uh, the as a service players like Salesforce, Workday, and others who are generating really significant revenues and really changing um, the stack of what people are buying and how they're consuming that technology. Um, the trends that we're observing are deals are getting shorter, deals are getting smaller. And more deals are being lost and more component of businesses being lost at renewal than ever before. And we're also seeing an enormous amount of attrition for these typical service providers. So the average attrition rates across the bigger players in this market have touched over 20% annually now, and it's growing at 20% a year. So the sort of talent uh, challenge is, is twofold. Can you hang on to the people that you've got? And secondly, can you fuel the growth that we're still seeing as a result of the digital adoption cycles that we see now? We think that, that that is the critical driver for disruption. Cal, I'd be really interested in your observations about the, the clients you're seeing and the clients we're seeing are starting to express some real reservations about the old world model of IT consumption and the old outsourcing premise, the old outsourcing value proposition. What do you make of that and how are you starting to take advantage of this tension? Lots of this is going to be anecdotal, right? Not a lot of it will be um, able to be evidenced because I'm not going to be able to name names, but I'll allude to, 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 to what I'm saying. But let's think about where we are with distributed, right? We're about 20 million annual run rate um, growing from, from zero over the past five years. Um, and I've been working with enterprise customers, like truly deeply working with enterprise customers, multi-million pound annual contracts for the past two years at a minimum, probably two and a half years in total, right? Yeah. A company of our size and our age sh shouldn't be saying that. So <laughs> that that lets you know how upset enterprise customers are with their existing provider. Absolutely, mate. If, Absolutely. If you look at the companies that we've unseated, um, so at British Petroleum we unseated uh, IBM, at British Telecom we unseated EPAM, um, at the BBC uh, we unseated Deloitte and Accenture. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're seeing is enterprise organizations take a look at how they are solving for, let's say, let's say they're looking at their workforce composition. Yeah. Because when you, when you look at what needs to be done, you look at your workforce composition, which portion goes to your traditional outsourcing, which portion goes to consultancies, um, which portion could you potentially solve via marketplace? And up until very recently, that portion was 0%. Yeah. Because... Engaging open talent at scale requires you to find people, qualify them, onboard them, manage them, pay them, and retain them. And you have to do that. When we're talking about these types of companies, it's not five people a month. Yeah. Like they have 20,000 person per quarter problems. Yeah. yeah. You know? yeah. So what, what we're seeing out in the market is these enterprise players, they're looking for workforce solutions and their experience over the past 10 years has been one of consistently growing costs and consistently declining quality. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, what I think what's playing in your favor, I'm interested in this too, it seems to me like 
the old way of change used to be these monolithic systems that were being implemented consistently and globally in relatively, you know, waterfall models that would take 18 months to 24 months to get anywhere close to conclusion and business case. Seems to us like businesses that are winning in digital are baking it down into much smaller chunks of change. They're much more agile. They're able to break down individual customer experience developments into much smaller fragmented pieces of work and just get them done and get them out there fast and learn. And I think that's put too much pressure on the old resourcing model for some of these incumbent players from, from my perspective and what we've seen. And they're just not able to pull that through, one. And secondly, because everybody's changing the same way and they're all pulling on the same skill sets at the same time, we're, we're competing for resources between, you know, Amazon, WH Smith, the UK government uh, and, you know, and, and manufacturers in New Zealand. They're all pulling on the same skill set. So, you know, we've got to think differently about this problem, right? I couldn't agree more. Yeah, the, the um, what you're also seeing is a new generation of um, heads of of directors of C-suite. Yeah, a new generation is emerging that's prepared to think digitally because they're, let's face it, the first digital generation. Like I'm, I'm not young, but I'm not yet old. At least I don't feel it. <laughs> relatively, I, <laughs> relatively. <laughs> I I remember no internet, and I remember internet. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Since internet happens to now, the pace of change, I mean, there's there's no word that, that could correctly describe the veracity, the, the velocity of change, right? Um, and we started off building IT systems and software in the same way that we built a bridge or a motorway, just waterfall, all this stuff needs done and it's going to get done in this time. That yeah. was, and then when we started thinking with the software first or with, with a digital first mindset, everything got so much faster because yeah. it's so much quicker to build a piece of software than it is a bridge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you've now got the likes of Tesco's competing for the same talent as Google, yeah. which is a frightening world to live in if you're one of, if you're, a, let's say, a legacy player or a, a very established player in the market. Yeah, 100%, 100% agree, mate. You know, uh, but you know, what encourages me, and just before we turn to look to the future, is that it's, it's okay, it's faster, it's definitely faster. It feels like it's easier. But what we're seeing is like winners in this space, the metrics they're performing to now are, are demonstrating that there's massive benefit in it in all sorts of different ways. You know, people that have adopted the model we're talking about are delivering solutions with a, um, a sort of release frequency that's 900 times faster than the old legacy model. Mm. So that, that implies all sorts of changes and challenges to me. They've got 50% less technology to do that in terms of the scale of the applications they're, they're using. It's so much more automated. And they're spending more than half the money on changing stuff, not just running it. So that the impetus and the focus that the talent needs to be able to bring to bear on that has got a very different outlook. And, and, the, and the results are, are profound, right? Three to five times better net, net promoter score, two to three times more uh, improved return on equity, 25% lower cost for the enterprises that are leading digital change and much higher levels of employee engagement for those people that adopt the sort of models you're alluding to. So, you know, if you, if you get challenged on, is this sustainable? Is this going to stay? Yeah, <laughs> pretty clear that it is. Yeah, the only constant is change and change is accelerating. Yeah, 100%. That, 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 uh, can you imagine, but Bryn, imagine the quality of talent you need to be good at that, to live, to live in a constantly fluid and constantly improving environment um, on enterprise scale yeah 100 percent. it's frightening right because it's not just 100 percent of available talent you're actually competing for about 30 percent of that talent yeah Pro proper proper battle Pro proper proper challenge and so you know I, I think you know we said the second bit we we look, we'd just like to look forward on all of this you know what blew my mind and i mentioned this to you when we were warming up the other day you know, this year will be the first year that more, you know, more than 50% of the world's gross domestic product is going to come through those businesses that have digitally transformed. And that sort of blew me, blew my mind in two ways. Like one is that's a hell of a that's, lot. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a, platform businesses, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. People that have adopted this change cycle that we're talking about, you know, that's a lot of money. That's $55 trillion. Uh, and now, you know, two things about that. One is kind of, it's grown so quickly, it, like that's fourfold growth since 2018. So the pace of change, uh, you know, we've got all the data to support your your proposition there, but we're only halfway through the journey. Right? If, if that's 50 percent, you know, we've only just begun. And I, I do think and I'm, I'm interested in your opinion on this as well. It's taken us, you know, five, six, seven years to get to this halfway point. 
it ain't going to be another five, six, seven years to to get to the next, you know, next stage of that journey. We're going to see more and more of that. Where do you see the sort of the, the big challenges coming as we as we support that growth, we support that continued transformation? We can we can call that Bryn's law. <laughs> let it be from <laughs> henceforth. Let it be known. <laughs> yeah, the the um, percentage of GDP generated by platform businesses. So the, what's gonna what's gonna happen? Like you just alluded to, the businesses that are digital first, the businesses that are willing to adapt their existing models to adopt new models, to engage with modern ways of working and yeah. move away from the monolithic, the waterfall. Um, the huh, the the established traditional staffing models are going to win, and we're going to see a lot of changes in Fortune Fortune five hundred because of it. It's yeah. going to, it's going to be in flux because the speed of change is going to is going to pick up. You you know how fast somebody can bring a new customer offering to market, and how quick customers can change now, right? Yeah. Um. So we're going to see a lot. Well, yeah, we're going to see a lot of shifting sands in the enterprise yeah definitely. Uh, I, I see models like like distributed um like touring like 18 like top tal really really starting to grow at pace you you, you talk to you talked about you know the traditional behemoth outsourcers 20 30 billion a year in annual revenues you're going to see public and private talent clouds get to the same level of revenue in a quarter of the time yeah, I genuinely believe that. And, you know, the, those guys, those those big fellas, they're, they're growing at yeah, maybe single digit growth. Now, I mean, they are they're already at scale, so you kind of expect that. But the platform, you know, the platforms we're observing and there's over 700 now. These individual marketplaces are really starting to get specialized. We're growing north of 20 to 40 percent. You know, it's exponentially different. So, we, you know, we, we definitely agree with that. We definitely see a huge shift in emphasis and a huge shift in talent deployment. You know, the the, the World Economic Forum was was putting out some really big numbers they're saying that this this bit of the journey we're talking about this next couple of years is going to see about 85 million jobs displaced by this sort of technology change but well over 97 million created as a result of the new tech and the new delivery models that you're alluding to much more focus on artificial intelligence and machine learning customer experience redeployment and creating insights around all of that that's where the new focus is going to be and hopefully it'll take some of the more mundane activities out of the system we've been talking about that for a while but it's definitely shaping up and the scale yeah. is also followed so so how, in your roadmap in the distributed go forward plan how, how are you solving for that what sort of things can we expect from you guys to to support and enable that we keep it very simple at distributed we're a talent first and we're a team's first company um, our mission here at distributed is to deliver freelance careers with more benefits than permanent employment yeah to ensure that the talent community we're creating and the team assembly platform that we're creating um, continues to scale with excellent experiences, both at the customer and the talent side. We already know that about 40% of available digital talent are freelancers. Yeah. That's growing at 5% per year and will continue to do so. You give that out to 10 years, the majority of digital talent are going to be in complete control of their careers. And that's going to be enabled by companies like us and our yep. partner organizations. Yeah. And, you know, open assembly are going to play a huge part in that too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, because you guys already have them. Um, so what's on our roadmap? Our roadmap is to consistently assure that, that we are ahead of the curve in developing features and benefits on our platform for talent. Yeah. That's it. By doing so, we ensure that our customers who are predominantly enterprise and um, that want to engage freelance um, and deploy freelance teams at scale get the very best outcomes possible. Yep. Why I hear you ask, Greg, because why Cal? <laughs> happy, engaged, mission aligned talent deliver the very best outcomes proven time and time and time again. Um, and when you're talking about freelancers who already deliver higher productivity, higher quality outcomes than traditional employees, the scope of what we can do with enterprise customers is is quite exciting. Yeah, hundred percent. There's an interesting question just come through about you know the supply demand ratio and how does that look in the field of IT talent? How's that changing in the next few years? Uh, I've got a top line answer to that, Cal, but feel free to back me up on this because you know all, all the research we've done and what you know the Harvard guys are telling us is that we've got we're going to have a shortage 
um, of, uh, of IT and ops talent, order magnitude, 150 million roles in the next three years. I think there's consensus that, you know, the, these AI, ML, ops and execution type roles will be short globally to that order of magnitude if nothing changes. So that's a huge, huge vacuum that we're going to be operating in. The flip to that is what we see probably, you know, the next generation of people entering the, the job market. Let's put aside who's fallen out of it at the top end at the moment. Probably about 500 million youngsters in the same period of time coming into the workforce, a good 30, 40 percent of whom will be definitely focused on that tech and ops component of the world. So if if we're able to engage that fresh talent in this talent platform model, which I think is going to be the sort of preferred modus operandi, if we're able to level the playing field and make that an accepted career path with protected financial benefits and you know equal rights in the workforce, then there's a fair chance we can get close to redressing that balance. That's the sort of open assembly mantra on it. That's that's the focus of our teams in the center of the transformation for work and why they're trying to catalyze all of that thinking. Do you, do you see it the same way? Pretty much, but I've got some other frightening stats for you. So supply supply to demand. It's currently supply versus demand, one to three at the moment. Yeah. Probably going to grow to one to six over the next five years. Yeah. Now, you talked about 500 million people entering the job market. Of course, there are people leaving at the top end, right? And you said 40% are going to be in, in technology. Okay. I understand that. Let's talk about it in software development specifically. Right? Yeah. About 2 million advertised today's software development jobs. Uh, that's between the UK and the US. Uh, here's a bit of a, here's a quiz for the chat. Get your, get your buzzers at the ready. You win a hat. Can you win a distributed hat? You can win a, do you know what? Yes, you can win a distributed hat. And I'll, uh, from uh, I'll personally send it from here. Um, um, live from the ISS. By the way, my background's only like this because I just moved house and all the is behind these boxes. <laughs> You're not actually, um, basically. Um, so you've said 500 million, 40% are going to be in tech. Um, it's going to be about 150 million jobs available. There's 2 million software development positions advertised today. How many computer science graduates can the US and the UK deliver to the market per year? Maximum capacity. Yeah, but it's nowhere near, is it? <laughs> good, 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 good answer, Rishi. That's close. I'm going to do a countdown of three, two, one 300k i know that yes you do know the answer Adam. um the answer is uh, just shy of sixty thousand. yeah frightening uh, just shy of sixty thousand. so for for a start everybody needs to stop asking for degree level qualifications because you're going to have to be self-taught non-traditional routes to employment are going to have to take precedence if you want to have any hope of filling that gap yeah yeah, definitely. No, I get it. And, you know, we, we're starting to see more and more recognition, at least, even if it's not tangible action, sort of government, state, education bodies starting to realise that they're going to have to think differently if we're going to fuel what employers are, are now asking them for. And in fact, what the public sector, actually, the problem's not unique in the private sector, well, right? this is just as painful on the public sector side of the house. So starting to see some UK government action, some European government action, some state interest in India about making it more attractive to be a frank freelancer, supporting them financially, uh, making it equitable, uh, creating more excitement and opportunity, even at school level, level and university level to get exactly what you're talking about cracks is not happening fast enough and it's not happening in the relevant skill areas at the moment no it's just not universities don't have the capacity we need non-traditional routes into the market yeah accelerated too yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the bottom line on this bit that, you know, we we see these risk reports coming out from the FTSE 100, from the you know Forbes 500 companies globally. This year, the talent, talent retention and talent acquisition for digital is in the top three corporate risks now for the first time. I think that's, you know, that's 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 the bottom line on, on this bit of the conversation. Would, yeah. would you like to hear a customer quote from two months ago, Brian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to deal with my churn. Just to deal with my my software development employee churn, you would need to be sending me fifteen thousand people every two months for us to stay flat. Yeah, yeah. 
that's just, such <laughs> an amazing quote. It's like jaw dropping, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. And that's the reality. I mean, we, we've got, you know, several client engagements underway now on that order of magnitude, fixing that problem. So, so why don't we turn to that, right? Last few minutes, let's just say, okay, so what then? I mean, that, I think we, we get it. We see it. We can quantify it. It's enormous. It's definitely coming. It's really exciting. But if you're one of these three groups, if you're a freelancer or if you're a buyer of IT services today, uh, you know, or, uh, what are you going to do about it if you're an incumbent? I mean, I'll start because, you know, some of our clients are some of these incumbent service providers and the more forward thinking of them are doing one of two strategies, right? We see, you know, Accenture is a great case in point. They started to change their value proposition they grasp this whole you, you see it with Accenture Digital which has got a billion dollar of revenues now they've started to integrate a whole set of from advertising through to digital execution capability in a stack so they do six dollars of that for every dollar of old world IT services that they provide I think that's a, that's a fabulous right. pivot and it's teed them up for an amazing experience their capability is so relevant on the other hand you see some forward thinkers like UST who are starting to take the open talent model and make that available to their clients. So they've started to say, well, we, you know, we couldn't support and satisfy the demand through the traditional model. You were constraining us in terms of the contract and policy and onboarding uh, cap capabilities that you would allow us to use. If you if you allow us to take those shackles off, we can give you access to a new talent channel that's much more dynamic and much more relevant for you. So there's a couple of really tangible strategies that the incumbents are starting to adopt. Certainly the ones that are successful, the ones that are not successful, they're having to split themselves into flog their legacy business and rebaseline their valuations. But you know that, that's what we see happening on the incumbent service provider side. How do you see it playing out for the IT buyers? What, what are the sort of conversations you're, you're advising on now? How, how do people need to think differently about this? in some yeah in a lot of ways we're first through the door specifically in the uk you know whereas um maybe gigster were in the states uh, yeah first through the door in terms of scale um so the, which is why we care so much about open assembly and, and and other bodies that exist to accelerate the adoption of open talent at scale right what the position we're in now is we're developing systems integrations um frameworks workflows to make it easy for yeah. buyers, right? And the onus is not on the buyer to make it easy for us to sell. It's on us to make us easy to buy. Yeah. And it's, it's tough because the, some of these organizations are 200 years old. I know, and they've designed these processes to protect themselves. We love it. You know, well, guess what? My, you know, my onboarding process, my 12-week onboarding process takes 12 weeks every time I do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, always because you built it that way, because that's what you're trying to deliver. <laughs> but you have some real visionaries in the space, like Har Harmi Met at uh, BT, who's demanding that these old ways of working are broken down, re-architected, and, re and done so at the pace that, we'll see the company survive and flourish and you know have a meaningful future there yeah. so and again that's a new generation of leadership being, yeah. being brought into organizations so um if i'm an it buyer i should be looking for a partner uh, it services buyer should be looking for a partner that's making it easy for me to buy yeah and i should be looking to my leadership to to break apart the systems the hurdles the roadblocks um, that are stopping us from adopting models that, let's face it, are tried and tested now. Yeah, they're at the they're at the the first inflection point of scaling. Yep. Um, that let us adopt those models that are going to see us be able to deliver a meaningful future for our customers and our our team members. A hundred percent, mate. I think you're you're absolutely spot on, and you know I particularly relate to what you're just saying about they're proven now. You know what we've without doubt established is that you can onboard talent quickly, safely. Uh, and intelligently using this technology. Now, when you come to scale it, I think our guidance to the enterprise buyer guys and girls has been, you need to think about orchestrating work differently. You know, five years ago, you had these options of, do I outsource it? Do I give it to contingent labor? Do I use my internal staff to deliver it? Or can I automate it? Now there's potentially, if you scale this right, there's a new game in town and you've got to think really carefully about how you could orchestrate work that's suited to the characteristics of open talent more accurately and faster into that new channel. So I think, you know, elevating this to a more strategic thought process about orchestration and the future of your work is where this is definitely going to go from that IT bias perspective. And that's quite a shift. Yeah. What work where, basically. 
our yeah. workers were. That's the that's the pipeline. That's the filter that we need to pass things through now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you so did, you're, you're alluding to taskification too, right? Yeah, and and again, there's a portion that's taskification. There's a port that there's there's a portion that's actually just assemble a team, and this is the outcome we're looking for. No need yeah. for taskification. Um, but again, that's probably a whole other fireside. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's do that. I'll, I'll try and get a fireplace. I'll get a fireplace built for the next iteration. We'll <laughs> yeah. Like I have one in here. It's yeah. just, it's one burn. <laughs> So taskification is such a huge passion of ours. You know, like we, we made such a difference to people's lives when we were able to automate work. And, we, and by, by breaking down what was in a business process or a set of tasks and creating the opportunity to shift how that was executed, it just changed the game in ops and technology delivery. We think we're going to you know, be able to get the same sort of return on that by thinking the same way. Let's break down the work that we're looking at and take a skills-based view on it, not a role-based view on it. And then you've got a different opportunity altogether. And that's where scale or flow. I 100% agree with that. So then, then finally, let's just, you know, if, if you're a freelancer in all of this, uh, which you probably are, because you're like 45% of the global workforce now, like you were saying, there's well over one and a half billion of you floating around out there now. So how do you set yourself up for success, Cal? What, what, are, you, what are you doing to help people survive and flourish in this platform model? Uh, I mean, I've, this is, um, I, to, to, to you, that's me blowing my own trumpet here. I've not seen anybody lead with a mission with a, with a mission statement that's focused on uh, enabling freelance careers, independent careers, because it's a career choice as far as I'm concerned. It's not gig yeah. work. It's not part-time work. It's my career is completely independent, which means I want control over where I work from, who I work for, who I work with, all that sort of stuff. Right. So if I'm a freelancer today, um, it's a it's unless you're part of our elastic teams, right? It's a bit of a lonely place. There's a lot of decisions to make. It's a lot yeah. of responsibility. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of weight on your shoulders because you're only as good as the last job you did, all that sort of stuff. But it's way better than it was five years ago. <laughs> yeah. And in five years, there'll be there will be more platforms, more employers, more features and benefits packages, more support than we have ever known. Because the, the pace that we're running at, everybody else is running at too, right? which is going to see a hugely bright, welcoming um, and exciting future for freelancers. So exactly the place I started, you know, I, I, I quit my job because I was I was sick of internal politics and process. Yeah. Slowly, no, I was just sick of it slowing down what I wanted to do, which is. Oh, I get it. I get it. Right? Yes. Um, so so quit your job, go freelance. Uh, the world will catch you. Like I said, for every for every one freelancer, there's like three to five opportunities today. Go yeah. for it. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, that's spot on. I, I mean, really relate to that. And, you know, the message you were giving earlier. So, so I think I think we're on the same page, definitely. So, so look, we we're running out of oxygen. Really, we've got a few minutes left, which we wanted to create space for to to open up the microphone and give people a chance to to, to drill into any of the stuff we're talking about. But you know, the, if if you think about what we've covered, the ground we've covered today, you know, the state of the enterprise IT services market is in rude health. There's a significant room for growth there's a hell of a lot of change taking place within it when we look forward we can see the sorts of drivers that are changing the nature of that engagement in terms of how enterprises want to buy what they need from it uh, and what they're going to get out of that experience and it's really clear that the current model is not fit for purpose so this disruption is definitely coming we're seeing all of the statistics that back that up and when you put the supply and demand factor on top of it you know we, we're very very confident the model we're talking about and the adoption of open principles are really going to create a significant amount of disruption and I think depending where you are in that journey as a freelancer as a buyer or as a supplier of those services is some very uh, very different implications so that's our synopsis uh, we we think we know but we're very open-minded so let's let's get some challenge on that awesome supporting data guys and girls over to you let us know if you've got any questions you want to put to to Kelmy and Alina or I'll go and check if there's been further political disruption in the UK <laughs> Well, I do have maybe, uh, and maybe you have explained that I missed. Sorry, but um, uh, I find it very challenging. If we talk about shortage of talent and demand is still growing, how does freelance is going to solve that problem? What a fantastic question <laughs> that I can <laughs> absolutely <laughs> answer. So, 
global talent shortage, which is driving most people freelance, right? Why are freelancers the solution? Freelancers are the solution for two reasons. First reason, they've never been engaged at scale, specifically within the enterprise, okay? And if you go, if you adopt on-demand talent models, it means we can share talent all the time. We're not trying to own 100% of talent's time. We only need to, to use the talent to deliver the work that's required of them that week, that month, that quarter. And then they can move on to their next engagement, which by the way, is what talent want. It's varied and interesting work. So if we use talent at a global scale, if we use them on demand and we only use them for when for what we need them for, we can go a long ways to filling that gap. It still won't be filled. There's still going to be shortages, but it won't be felt as severely as feeling the whole of the 150 million shortage. Yeah, I mean, the, I'd add a couple of things to that, uh, Cal. You know, what the guys at Harvard are telling us is that um, deployment of open talent models sees a 35% uptick in productivity compared That's, to in yeah, house resource. The, the freelancers you're typically bringing in to do tasks and outcome based work don't get distracted by politics, meetings. You know, they're typically remote. They're able to focus very clearly on the task. And more often than not, they're absolutely brilliant at what they do because it is their core business. So they're able to bring another dimension. So immediately you fill or could potentially fill 35 percent of the shortage just by getting more out uh, of, of, of the deployment you're able to make. And secondly, we're able to deploy talent from what we've seen in the work we've done five times faster. So if you are a service provider and you've got 20,000 people and it's taken you 12 weeks to onboard that talent, if you can onboard that talent in two to three days, which is what we're able to do when we get this right, immediately you're taking, you know, five and a half, five and a half times uh, the speed of deployment creates another huge amount of capacity that we're currently not able to access. It's just waiting and caught up in the caught up in the system. So, you know, everywhere you look in the value chain, there's an opportunity to take 10, 20, 30 percent more and apply it to this problem, I think. That's a great way of looking at it. It's where, where you remove the 10 to 30 percent instead of trying to solve for the 100 percent, right? Yeah, and we're not going to crack the whole problem. Our, our premise has never been that the whole world's going to go freelance and the whole world will be employed in that model. It's yeah. never going to be that way. But you can certainly address this, this gap, I think, when we get it right. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot. And another question I have and um, uh, is, obviously, there is a tendency to look into talents that cost less. Uh, and we speak here about countries, um, for example, Pakistan. I know there are lots of um, uh, IT brains located out there or maybe other country. So uh, are there any standardization or anything done in regards to actually make some sort of equality in terms of pay? Because obviously hiring freelancer here in IT in, in Belgium will cost much more than hiring someone in, uh, in other country which has less taxes and uh, social burden. Yeah, I think my, my view, Cal, feel free to chuck in on the back of this, is like the best dynamic that's coming through all of this is the marketplace dynamic. You know, what, what we're able to offer here is real-time skills availability for a given price. And, and I think although there is still the massive geographical variances based on, you know, a really strong legacy position, it's starting to shift and you're starting to see much more price sensitivity around hot skill. And, then, and we're looking at that harmonizing much more on a global basis. Our, our view is like 60% of talent on the tech and ops space in the platform world is in Asia. It's starting to shift a little bit, but it's not changed a lot over the last year. Um, so, you know, that what we've seen is that is the rates in key talent areas, key skill requirement areas start to lift uh, and we're able to deploy that talent into work anywhere globally. So I think you'll see that trend continue. Cal, I don't know if that makes sense from what you see. Uh, uh, our opinion is you're going to see a normalization over the next five to 10 years uh, because talent is not going to, they're not even going to be asked where they are. They're going to be asked to take a, a series of tests or, or qualifications to ensure that they are the right talent for the job to be done. Um, and that rate is effectively going to be normalized across the job to be done instead of where you're from. Yeah. Um, so we're going to see a lot more global mobility, <laughs> basically. Um, it's going to take some time. Like Brent said, there's hugely entrenched and established status quo there that need to be broken in the move away from, um, you know, paying people based on their postcode. Um, but it will happen. You'll see a normalization. Um, you're going to be able to, well, we're going to be onboarding talent into enterprise over the next two years that they, we don't even need to know, you know, our customers don't even need to know their full name, their age. 
yeah. their sex, their race, all that yeah. sort of stuff. Like it's it's going to be completely blind hiring based on outcome quality. Yeah, hundred percent. I have a question for Bryn. Bryn, you mentioned about the productivity increases and the deploying much faster. I guess that's predicated on 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 the change in the organization's operating model and to allow you to do that, right? Um, to, yeah, to an extent, at a pretty mundane level too. I mean, you've got to be able to create, you know, relatively quick access to to the work that needs to be done. It's got to be safe and secure. And there's some really basic steps that have to be taken to facilitate that quickly. And they're really, you know, sending laptops to people takes two weeks. So you blow that productivity, you know, that's gone already if you're in that mode. So it's not without its challenges. And a lot of work we're doing is about smoothing those old old ways of thinking and old ways of working around onboarding and access creation out of the way so we can get people straight to the point faster but actually when they're in the work it, their, their ability to leverage real talent um is is like it is definitely delivering this productivity benefit and it's it's sometimes easier to describe so even it's like the, the basis for some of that productivity even though they're just marginally better at what they do because they do it a lot some some of these guys and girls have completely rethought how they code They've, they've, they've got exponentially better output and productivity levels because they've thought hard about if I'm given this task and I'm given it a lot, how can I get it done faster than I would otherwise do? And most of them have automated how they operate on a task. I was going to say they've probably business. built an automation there. <laughs> it's just phenomenal. So, so I think, you know, yes, partially. And yes, it's about enablement and, and allowing that to happen. And, and I think your, your other point, I think maybe what you're driving at is, there's no point having one really fast spinning cog if everything else is moving really slowly. Yeah, yeah. they definitely see that. But as, as we were starting to say, being able to break down the work, taskify it and lump like like components together take some of the risk out of that equation thank you a great and great vision Callum as well I mean your view around uh, I mean I know some of the existing work practices around clients wanting to interview service provider staff before they accept them onto their their project um to get to a point where I would totally agree where you know you don't need to know that person um is, is is a while away yet but i think it's going to move very quickly as soon as there's a bit of momentum that happens in in the whole marketplace yeah there, there needs to be kind of an enterprise standard achieved and believed and then it's done that's it right and that we're in the business of that so we're going to we're going to keep pushing as hard as we can